Uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd, before I start, I think there's an important cultural context that may be missed in this conversation about unaccompanied children. Um, one is that in Latino families and Latino communities, not just Latino communities, mind you, I, I understand that this applies in many other cultural contexts as well, is that what gets defined as family is different than what usually or traditionally gets defined as family in the United States. Um, when I was a child, my parents would often send me to Puerto Rico during the summers, and I would live with my aunts and my uncles and my cousins. My cousins were raised with me as my siblings. You know, they were, I would call them brother, sister. My aunts and my uncles were raised as secondary parents. Um, in fact, the actual word con madre or compadre means co-mother, co-parent. And this is the cultural context with which children are coming to the border with their loved ones. They are being taken, they, are being, they arrive, and then they are being called unaccompanied children, when in fact they are accompanied. They're accompanied by their grandmothers, they're accompanied by older siblings, they're accompanied by cousins, and just because it is that person that is coming with them, their guardian, is not their biological mother or father, then they're being accused of human trafficking and they're being accused and, and called an unaccompanied child. But they are experiencing the same trauma that any, tra that any child would be experiencing if they were ripped from their own mother or father. Ms. Long, do you find that that's uh, in agreement with your experience? I am in complete agreement with how you've summarized that situation. And I also want to add that CBP currently maintains no records to trace those families. And so when someone is separated from, say, their tia who's raised them, maybe for their whole lives, um, there is no way for the agency to then trace those family relationships and put those families back together. And, and I myself am in, in a similar situation in that I have nieces and nephews and there is, an, there is an already unspoken understanding that if anything were to happen, so I call them my nieces and nephews and they're technically second or third cousins or what, whatever, however other folks would, would call that. Um, that if something, God forbid, were ever to happen to my cousins, I would take those children as my children. Mm -hmm. My nieces and nephews would be taken as my son or daughter. Mm -hmm. um, so quickly moving forward, under the Trump administration, at least six children have died in U.S. custody. Um, I have their names up here. Darlene Cristabel Cordova Valle, age 10. Jacqueline Cal Maquin, age 7. Felipe Gomez Alonso, age eight, Juan de Leon Gutierrez, age 16, Wilmer Josue Ramirez Vasquez, age two, Carlos Gregorio Hernandez Vasquez, age 16. Those are just the ones that we know of. We didn't even hear of Darlene's death until eight months after she died. And this is not including the children like Marie, who we heard about earlier, who fell gravely ill due to the neglect and lack of sanitation inside DHS custody. But they died only after being released from detention facilities, so her death doesn't quote unquote count. In the 10 years prior to that, there were no similar deaths, zero, of migrant children in U.S. custody. This is a new phenomenon under the Trump administration. Ms. Fry, how many migrant children are similarly falling ill and dying but are not being counted as a death in CBP custody? I don't know the number, but I can, I, I have no idea of the number or you'd have to ask the government, but I can um, verify for you the reasons why this is happening now so much, it's so much a, a greater um, uh, incidence. Um, and that goes back to the question of release. When you don't promptly release children, they go to ORR uh, and they're held there. They're not released. The mechanism isn't working. The, the requirements under the TVPRA and under Flores for prompt expeditious release are ignored. Then you get a backup in these unsanitary places where you pack kids uh, in, in a kind of a congregant care with, uh, uh, the WHO says, 
to prevent the spread of disease, wash your hands. There's no soap and water. So we, we make a situation there by the way we detain kids because they can't go upstream because they aren't being released that is conducive to illness. And I think that's part of the reason in the family facilities we just aren't providing care. The doctors. And Ms. Long, very quickly, are we, are, is there any policy that you know of that requires ICE to count pregnant women? and women who are pregnant record them? Not that I know of, no. So we don't even know how many of these women, there's no requirement to even acknowledge, count, or record a woman who is pregnant in custody, and we know of at least 28 miscarriages, at least. A Congresswoman, that is also um, true of, of children. And we saw at the RGV uh, girls who were pregnant who weren't being given any medical care, and nobody seemed to even care that they were pregnant. And that's really serious. Thank you. Gen can, I, can I just add, General ladies, can I just, can I just yes. add that when, when females are taken into ICE custody and they're, they're, they're contemplating being detained, that they're all given a pregnancy exam. And so soon after, they're, within the first 24 hours they're in ICE custody, uh, medical practitioners are aware of their pregnancy. Thank you. Um, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr.